The gruesome discovery of four bodies near the Century Railway Station in Cape Town has struck fear among commuters and residents. Naked, with their hands behind their backs, the women were found here in shallow graves. Similar discoveries were made in the same area earlier this year, but police are refusing to say whether this is the work of a serial killer. However much you try to avoid it, crime is an inescapable reality in South Africa. Its story is ever-present in the media and its brutality altering lives forever. Healing from its ravages is a complex and often unreachable process, but for many, it has profound beginnings in the conviction of the perpetrator. The end of the road for Kangai Sedumedi. The 32-year-old former security guard entered into a plea agreement with the state after a killing spree between 2011 and 2015. Seven life sentences will not bring Kangai Sedumedi's victims back, but if it were not for DNA evidence that linked him to his crimes, his killing spree may never have ended. I'm about to meet Vanessa Lynch, who founded the DNA Project after her father's brutal murder. She's worked tirelessly for the last decade to improve the way DNA is used to obtain convictions for violent crimes in South Africa, crimes like the one perpetrated against her father. 23 cases, okay, where they've collected DNA evidence from sexual assault evidence kits. It's linked this person over a five-year period to all of those, all those cases of rape. With consistency, there's no other evidence that is shown to be as reliable as DNA evidence. The scientific accuracy and the objectivity of it is considered to be very high in terms of its forensic evidentiary value. Durban serial rapist pleads guilty. See, this is a recent one from 28 July. Re research has shown that when defendants are presented with DNA evidence against them, they often turn their plea from non not guilty to guilty, mm. and they enter into a plea bargain because it's such convincing evidence. It's so wow. great to get the convictions. I mean, even for people who are working as prosecutors, as investigators, yes. they've got this tool now to say, we're gonna, we're gonna do it. Yes. CSI crime investigation shows and the role of forensic DNA evidence in bringing criminals to justice get top audience ratings around the globe. But in the real world, murder brings with a deep and personal loss. Yeah. Vanessa Lynch knew very little about the science of DNA or how investigations work until her father, John Lynch, was senselessly murdered at their family home. It took her on a journey that consumed her for nearly a decade as she lobbied for a national DNA database and worked tirelessly to get a DNA bill passed that would change the way that all crime scenes are treated in South Africa. I can look at photographs before and after my father's death. There was life before and life after. Life was good because when your family's intact and, you know, every, everything's possible. Life was good before then, and life became hard after that. He was only 65, and he was strong. And the surgeon actually said later, said, your father was incredible. And the autopsy showed that he was in such great condition. To have even survived, and he was shot seven times, to have even survive that long it was incredible. Um, and it was just that he'd lost too much blood, that, that's, that's why he, he died. A lot of the lessons that he taught me while he was alive, I actually put into practice after he died. And I didn't realize at the time that so many of those lessons I would actually really apply to a great extent after he died. His family were his absolute everything. We had a, an incredibly happy family life. We really did. We loved doing things together. So um, he had an incredible influence over their life, of all the children, he really did. That's like a, a real lover's thing when you're feeding each other. <laughs> oh dear. It's Vanessa when she was eight months. I was born in Nairobi, in Kenya, and I'm one of four siblings. I have three brothers. 
I had a very happy childhood. We had an incredible family life and my parents spent a lot of time with us doing things. It was fun. There's Johnny holding his daughter. And this, this is actually such a beautiful one of Vanessa. I love that one. When she was little, she was very, very shy. And the shyness really showed when she started at nursery school. And she would walk in with her, her hand up and her face down like that, because <laughs> she felt that if nobody saw her, then she was, you know, she was all right. As she became a teenager, her voice became stronger. And um, what she felt very firmly about, she wasn't frightened of saying. So she stood up for what was right and what was wrong, just like her father. Looking back now, what she thought was arbitrary um, becomes very special. At that point in my life, I was just filming anything. You know, your dad is just there. <laughs> He's part of the furniture in many regards. OK, here we go. I think this is it, yeah. There he is over there, <laughs> part of the furniture. You often find that the, the family sitting around at the dinner tables talking. And Vanessa, um, Vanessa and my dad are very similar in ilk. You often find them with a book. Um, if my dad's not reciting poetry or doing a crossword with my sister, <laughs> it's a good shot of him. My dad was a fiercely loyal family man. And um, those traits you find very much in in Vanessa. The two of us were extremely close. Uh, we grew up together. Even though she was a younger sister, she used to chase me around the garden. And like my father, she was never one to ever stand down in any circumstances. A very proud moment with her LLB in Cape Town. But interesting, she wasn't going to do law. She was going to do fashion designing. When she left school, you know, they go off down to the coast and they have that party. And then she came home and she said, Mommy and Daddy, you need to sit down, I need to tell you something. And we thought, mm. <laughs> and <laughs> my mother now tells me that they thought, she's pregnant, oh my goodness. Anyway, so they sat down and I said, I'd really like to go to law school. Then they were so relieved I wasn't pregnant. Absolutely great. And I met Stuart sort of halfway into, into my LLB. We met in May and um, by October, I'd walk, again sat my parents down, I need to ask you something, because we decided to move in together. I wasn't pregnant. <laughs> it was just an immediate connection that we had. Vanessa and Stuart decided to get married and looked forward to building a life together. And that's her dad walking her in. As he walked down, the tears just ran down his face, because she's the only daughter. And there's a Johnny moment with a baby, crying. Oh, so emotional. I think when a new life comes into your family, it's such a miracle. And Chloe actually came early, and he just held this little thing and just looked at it. Tears, we all just... And you realise actually how precious, how actually precious life is. A son never thinks the father's ever going to die. And in my dad's case, I, I just, it just wasn't possible. He had this um, impenetrable spirit. I've seen him do things that are so courageous that a madman would do the kind of things he's done, um, in defense of his family, that is. I recall a time in Kenya we were, we were coming, driving back in, in, in darkness at, at midnight, and a brick came through our front windscreen. And uh, thankfully, I was lying down and missed him. But his first reaction was to stop the car and to challenge whoever was out in the darkness. It was a Tuesday night. I'd caught a bug, and I was in the bedroom. And a friend had come, so he was just seeing her out. And then he'd obviously walk back into the house. And then I just heard the shots. And there were f about five shots. And he was a, a person that um, 
would take anyone on. He'd protect his family. He wasn't a tall man by any means, but he had a heart. And he, he took them on. And um, I found him in the, um, the courtyard. And he was alive. I was able to tell him that I loved him. I was very grateful he was alive because I could speak to him, tell him. And he gave me his watch. And the next thing I'm listening to Stuart telling my mum how to keep my father alive. It was, it was surreal, it was surreal. Um, because he was still alive and my mum obviously was with my dad at the time and, and, the, and the medics hadn't, paramedics hadn't arrived. And as I said, it was, a, it was a very surreal moment. It was, I remember feeling I was looking down on Stuart talking to my mum and saying to myself, this, this is not happening, this, this is just not happening. Uh, the surgeon phoned Stuart just before midnight. Dad, and he just said, he's just not gonna make it. And then he died shortly thereafter. And I could only get to Johannesburg the next day. I got to the gate and as my mother had ran out the door. And she was like a broken bird. As a couple, you have a journey together and it wasn't part of the script, you know, but no one writes that kind of a script. So the reality is that, you know, is that there are, there are turns along the way and you have to manage those. And I think from both of our perspective, she was in a position where I understood that she, she, had a, she had a road to walk and she had to do it and I accepted that. Life will never be the same again. The cold-blooded murder of John Lynch left his daughter, corporate lawyer Vanessa Lynch, and her family devastated. Vanessa held on to the hope that her father's killers would be apprehended and convicted. But his death also took her on an unexpected journey. After the initial shock, she began to question how crimes were being investigated in South Africa. It's a blur. You know, what, hap what happens next when, when someone's been taken so violently from you? You can't think, you can't feel. And I just trusted that, that the crime would be investigated in the usual way. A few weeks later, when the investigators came to the house and they sat at our dining room table and told us that they were going to close the case because there was no evidence and they'll never catch these guys. And they actually sat at this table and they closed the phone. They said that was it. And that's where Vanessa said no. And I remember sitting there thinking, is that it? Really, my father's just been murdered and you're not going to do anything further. So immediately people think, well, this is the police's fault and it's, it's not, we're all involved here. When I spoke to a very well-known forensic pathologist, he said to me, send me any evidence. We will be able to get kilograms of DNA from, from your father's crime scene. Clothing, um, in, anything that, that, that was touched, se send it to, to my laboratory in Germany and, and I'll uplift DNA evidence. So when I went back and I went through the crime scene, I realized a number of things. The first is that there were so many people who had been on the crime scene who weren't there previously, who may have taken things away that had been left behind. You would not be able to tell what had been left behind by the perpetrators. When we came back from the hospital the following day, family, friends and, and I don't exactly know who it was, but they'd come to the house and they'd cleaned all the blood and they'd cleaned up the house as, as if nothing had happened in order that we didn't feel offended when we came in and essentially wiped away all forensic evidence that could have been left behind at that stage too. 
I then went and asked the hospital, where's my father's clothing? And again, nobody knew where his clothing was. When I looked at the autopsy report, that they hadn't swabbed his fingernails, they hadn't swabbed his body for any forensic evidence, which could also have been found. The perpetrators had been drinking brandy and coke in the garden. And I asked them, but where, where's the bottle? And they said no, that it had been just thrown away, but didn't know that they could uplift any evidence from that. And, and at every turn, I came to a dead end because there was simply no evidence. You were doing all of this and you had your grief as well. Somebody said to me at the time, be careful, don't car carry your file and your fury around with you for the rest of your life. It's not going to bring him back. Good evening, welcome to the News at Seven. Lee Matthews, who was kidnapped 12 days ago in Santon, is dead. Forensic experts say she's been dead for about five days. Safety and Security Minister Charles Nkakula has instructed police to leave no stone unturned in tracking down the killers. I was often in Johannesburg to go and support my mum and help her. And we woke up one morning and the TV was on. Lee Matthews had been kidnapped and, and murdered. And there were 50 crime scene investigators on the scene. They were obviously trying to collect evidence. And I turned around and I said to my mum, but, but why? Why are there allocated 50 crime scene investigators and, and yet we had none? Crime in South Africa affects everybody equally. So we should all be given an equal opportunity to have our crimes investigated. And instead of carrying my father's file around with me for the rest of my life, I thought I could do something bigger. And when I started researching throughout the rest of the world and I understood that investigators couldn't conceive of investigating a crime scene without the use of DNA. And I understood that DNA laws were necessary in order for them to build up a national forensic DNA database, which we didn't have. These ideas started coming together for me, and I felt that I could do something. There was a lot of um, media around Lee Matthews' case, and, and her dad, Rob, and, and her mum were on TV talking. We've got so much more than many other people have got with their tragedies. Uh, there are many people out there that have not had the benefit of a closure. A basis that and I actually wrote a letter to Rob and explained my story, what had happened. What I did say to him is that you have a platform and you have a voice and you need to use it. And I have an idea. <laughs> and I want to meet with you. Nobody ever wants to hear that nothing can be done. I think you always want to have hope. You don't want false hope, but you want hope around even what can I do for somebody else? And I think that's Vanessa. And DNA was still as a tool in its infancy at that stage. What was required was not just the creation of an awareness, but also the infrastructure as far as legislation and as far as training. And so she asked, would I like to be part of creating and building that awareness with her? After I sent him the facts, he contacted me and he said, let's meet. And that, that was a catalyst. That's how we, how we started the DNA project. Could I first ask you, Vanessa, okay, what exactly do you want to achieve? Through the DNA project, we want to create awareness that the way in which the rest of the world has turned crime on its head is through the, the expansion of a DNA database. The effect of that is that people don't act with impunity. There is a consequence as a result of their actions, which at the moment there doesn't seem to be. And with Vanessa coming forward and listening to the plight of Vanessa and the many other South Africans out there that have a similar uh, story to tell where they uh, crime seems to go nowhere. I think Vanessa had a wonderful project and that's how the, the Lee Matthews Trust uh, in, uh, took it on board. We worked together in, in, first of all, approaching the Forensic Science Laboratory and saying, okay, what do you need? We think that DNA is fantastic. We think that there are a lot of things that need to be done in this country. What do you need? And initially they didn't get a very large budget from the government and they needed equipment. So we started raising money to buy equipment so that we could donate it to the laboratory, which, which we did. Any NGO needs money in order to do the work that they do. And that's where Alan Thompson came in, because he had lost his brother 
to a horrific murder. He had heard about the work that we had done and he had contacted us. And without the Change of Life Trust, we would never have been able to do anything. Ever since my first waking moments, I knew I had a brother. And we were two years apart and we were very, very close. All Mike really wanted uh, in life was to live peacefully, uh, to raise his family and, and to spend quality time with his family and with his kids. I do remember immediately after Mike's death, uh, sitting with the family saying, well, you know, where do we go from here? Do we emigrate? Do we look at emigrating? Do we stay? Do we become bitter and twisted? Or do we try and do something positive and prevent what happened to Mike, try and prevent that from happening to one other family? Someone said to her, they've heard of this girl in the Cape who is looking to solve crimes through DNA. And we were absolutely appalled the way that the crime scene was handled. We know that there was no DNA taken. So I got her details and I realized that I actually knew her. We were at school together. There was a match. And you could see there was a passionate person um, who had the skills, that had the drive to make a change and make it a big change in South Africa. And for me, it wasn't a difficult decision to say I wanted to see if I could help. In our regular science slot this Tuesday morning, we'll be chatting about the DNA Project, which is an initiative to develop and expand a national DNA criminal intelligence database. What they were doing in the laboratory in terms of the analysis and in terms of the scientific methodology was world standard, world class. In fact, they were doing so many checks and balances that the, the, the review came out that they didn't even need to do as many. But strategically, they needed to change things, and that was that instead of working on a case-by-case -case basis, which the Forensic Science Laboratory was doing, they weren't taking it a step further in terms of building up the DNA database. So in my dad's case, for instance, if they had taken evidence, if they had to uplift the DNA evidence from the bottle, the profiles could have been loaded onto the database had we had laws which allowed it. And 10 years later, if that person had been arrested, there would have been a match to the database. You could have linked that person to the crime scene. We needed laws in order to ensure that the database was used as a criminal intelligence database as opposed to a prosecutorial database, which meant that you were just using DNA on a case-by-case -case basis. Our legislation was very, very antiquated. It didn't matter how many people we had or how many skills we had or how many machines we had, we needed enabling legislation. We're approaching the Section 37 of the Criminal Procedure Act, which currently prevents a DNA profile being taken from a convicted offender. Mm. And this needs to be upturned. And we the first time that I saw Vanessa was on TV. I was teaching at the University of KZN in the genetics department. So of course, if there was something on TV that many years ago about DNA, it was of interest to me. So I sat down to watch and was immediately taken with her story and she was wanting to develop a postgraduate qualification in forensic DNA analysis. And being a university lecturer myself, I thought, well, maybe that's the one place where I could actually help. And very unlike me, I picked up the phone the next day and I, f I phoned her. When we met each other, we just hit it off, I guess, and both felt that we could make a difference in our own ways. She was a lawyer, I was a scientist, and our different talents, I guess, complemented one another. And we got on very well. So one thing led to another, and eventually I gave up my job at the university and worked exclusively with Vanessa. How are you doing? The team of Vanessa and Carolyn have been absolutely crucial. And I think she's been someone whom Vanessa can bounce ideas off, can be there for Vanessa. As a partnership, the two of them have been fantastic. When I told you that I'm not going to stop, I think that was my leap of faith. No, probably <laughs> that you. was. I've never seen her falter in all these years in her belief that she wanted to do something positive out of a very negative situation. The greatest leap of faith was getting out of bed that very first moment saying, OK, let me look at the criminal justice system. That's what I know. I'm a lawyer. And when she found that piece that was missing, that there was no legislation that specifically dealt with DNA evidence and that could have been exceptionally relevant in her father's case, that she would go about rectifying that situation.
The period between 2006 and 2010 was possibly the most difficult period for the family. I unfortunately at the time was living in America and we moved there in 2001 and, uh, and, and dad was killed in 2006. I'd obviously booked the ticket immediately to fly back. Um, but I had a lot of time to think about it um, in the plane. And so when you're 35,000 feet up in the sky and you're looking out the window, you know, you look for that moment of communication, you know. Whether there's a real communication, I'm not sure, but there's DNA in you that's, that's passed on from your parents. Whenever I find myself in difficulty, um, I, I put on his strength. And it's through love that you can draw on that strength. And so that's what Johnny has passed on to, to all of us. And in particular, yeah, very special relationship with Vanessa. She's got that dogged determination to do whatever's necessary to make it work. And she's prepared to take on that sacrifice no matter what. Every time I got in an airplane and I flew up to, to Johannesburg and I would always look out and there would always be some kind of light. <laughs> and uh, there would just be this kind of connection that I'm gonna do this. And at the same time, Vanessa took it upon her shoulders to, to carry the family, particularly my mother who for six years was, was lost, was broken. She was not gonna let anybody take away her dad without putting up a fight. And she took on the South African government. The law is the, is the fundamental catalyst to all of this. Every country with a developed DNA database, the only reason that they have a larger DNA database is because the laws allow them to do that. How do you change a law? <laughs> the thing is, anybody can do it. If you believe in something strongly enough, you, you just have to, to, to lobby the right people. The break came when I managed to get an interview with the then Deputy Minister of Justice, Alan and, and Carolyn, came with me to Pretoria. And initially it went very badly because I started talking about the UK database. The laws allow them to collect DNA samples from arrestees and convicted offenders. The, the greater the size of your database, the greater chance you have of linking an unknown crime scene profile to a known person. The minister just didn't want to have anything to do with it. He didn't want to listen to any stories about any other country other than South Africa. He literally told me to get out three times. <laughs> and if ever I've had to stand my ground, it, it was at that moment. And I said, no, no, I'm not going to go. You have to listen to me. You have to let me finish. And he did let me finish, thank goodness. And at the end of the presentation, he understood the advantage of having a forensic DNA database, but that you had to have laws to do it. And he said to me at the end of the day, whatever this lady needs, give it to her. I started working on drafting a bill with one of his assistants. It was called the Criminal Law Forensic Procedures Amendment Bill. By December 2009, the Cabinet had approved the first bill to go through to Parliament. When that bill was presented to the Ad Hoc Portfolio Committee in January of 2010, we really believed that by March, the bill would be passed. And it was going well. And then there was a public presentation that literally derailed the entire process. Hey. <laughs> so this is where it all happened? Yep, this is it. This is it. This is where I used to stomp the corridors of Parliament, sometimes till 11 o'clock at night. There wasn't a day that the Portfolio Committee met that I wasn't here. 
Did you have your parliamentary stride? Oh yes, very much so. <laughs> there was a photo taken of me with my file and my fury, in that case, marching down Parliament, because sometimes it was frustrating. Do you think a lot of them were surprised that you went the distance? Not when they got to know me, no. <laughs> I remember going to Parliament and ironically, the proponents against passing the bill were pop crew, the police union, who had some view that perhaps the DNA bill would be detrimental to jobs in the police. The other kind of unexpected one was from various human rights organizations. They thought that somehow the DNA would be an infringement of human rights. Um, so there were, there were hurdles all, all the way. It was probably the most infuriating and frustrating five years. And I do believe had we had started this journey five years ago, we would have saved lives. We here in South Africa haven't got a large population of criminals. We've actually got a relatively small population of criminals but are repeat offenders. An average criminal in South Africa will perpetrate over a hundred crimes before he's caught. Where in the UK, using DNA, the average criminal perpetrates between two and two and a half crimes before he's apprehended. So introducing DNA into South Africa would essentially rid us of this element of the population which are repeat offenders. And as in Mike's case, they were repeat offenders. They should never have been out on bail. And uh, they have perpetrated a number of crimes. If we could have got them out at the get-go, they wouldn't have been able to perpetrate all of these crimes. She looked at the crime and crimes, and I think the bigger picture is that she wanted to be part of a solution and not somebody who kept on complaining about that things were bad and, and nothing was being done. Um, and so I think it was during, during those times that she then identified all the different sort of bottlenecks and areas where there were difficulties along the way that had to be addressed in order that this vision that she had from the outset could be realized. She has the capacity to open those doors and, and I think, I think that, that's part of, part of the reason why she's been so successful uh, is, that, is that she is determined. The day that the bill was passed through the National Assembly, I remember thinking to myself, wow, and it wasn't because I did it, I didn't do it, but I had lobbied for this. We had fought for so long and hard together and yet we weren't in the same city when it happened. She phoned me and she said, where are you? I said, oh, I'm just in my car. She said, no, I'm just sitting by myself, but I actually don't want to go and talk to anybody. And I said, it's strange, I feel the same way. It was almost like a letdown. It had taken so long. It was almost an anticlimax when it happened. And I think at that point, both of us, but especially Vanessa perhaps, knew how much work was still ahead. I think this was what I was meant to do with my life. But obviously it has been at a great sacrifice, the loss of my father. So if I could take that back then, obviously I'd rather have that. Ten years after the murder of her father, Vanessa Lynch, founder of the DNA Project and her team, had helped to change the law. It will now allow for a DNA database, and this will change the way that crimes are treated, from the crime scene right through to prosecution. But how will it be implemented, and at what cost has it been achieved? We mustn't be complacent. We must be as shocked by what's happening around us as we are by what's appearing in the media so that we can say stop, keep out, do not disturb the crime scene. Correct. That's our role. We, we had crime scene tape printed and we give these to community police forums, paramedics. They're often the first to arrive on a crime scene and it's difficult to keep people rubbernecking and keeping crowds away and they put that up and people somehow respect that. There has to be a holistic approach to change. Yeah. You can't just say, well, here's legislation, but you don't have the infrastructure to support it. You need everybody to be on board. You need government to be on board to fund the implementation of the Act. You need the forensic science laboratories to be skilled enough to be able to ensure that they comply with the time periods within which they, they need to analyze the material. You need the police and the public to preserve and collect the evidence in the correct manner. 
and you need the officers of the court to know what to do with it. bag will have a reference number and that's what you track all the way through. As soon as it gets to the lab, they'll get a lab number as well, but they all link up to the case number at the end of the day. It's all very well to get the act passed, but it's meaningless unless it actually works in practice. And so the implementation is in many respects maybe the most difficult part of, of it. Making it work. We would hate all of this effort to have to, to not be worthwhile at the end of the day. The hit rate is relative to the size of the database. You want a hit rate because you want, to, you want to find the match between the two. In the UK, the hit rate is about 70, 70%. It can go up to 85% within 12 months, apparently. In South Africa, what do you think our hit rate is? 5%. No. <laughs> but it's going to get there. <laughs> it was about 0.1%. It's probably between 1% and 3% now, our hit rate. Okay. But because our legislation is in its infancy. My father, he always taught me about the elephant. How do you eat an elephant? And he said, bit by bit. After he died and, and I took on the DNA project, it was this enormous task. Initially it was funding for equipment, then it was the laws, then it was skills, preservation, training, developing honors course, because you needed to have skills in the laboratory. My mother looked at me <laughs> one day and said to me, you're farting against thunder, literally. <laughs> and had I known the enormity of it in the beginning, I probably wouldn't have taken it on. But I applied this elephant, literally, and I took it step by step. We've always been constructive. Negativity doesn't work. There's always good to be found in everything. We've met the most amazing people in every sphere of what we've done. And constructive assistance is what people are looking for. Forensic services uh, in the South African Police Service. I have met Vanessa soon after my appointment uh, as the Divisional Commissioner of Forensic Services. The trained police officers will then be going into the prisons to take samples as and when they're trained by buckle swaps only. She has got high levels of energy. She's very knowledgeable, very passionate. Uh, she's also a very pushy person in that uh, she will want uh, a, a point made uh, to be taken uh, very seriously and I enjoy it because uh, we always must be kept on our toes. You need a structure that plays an oversight role. Vanessa has certainly been very instrumental in this regard. DNA has no class. Whether the crime situation is in an informal settlement, whether it is in the township, whether it is in the president's house, it applies to everybody because everybody has DNA. The success of the DNA Act lies in its implementation and an oversight board on which Vanessa now sits has been established to ensure this. She works alongside board members like former Constitutional Court Justice Yvonne Mohoro, checking that the act that she's invested so much in is being adhered to effectively. It is very rare that somebody has been so personally affected by an issue and that person still has a positive disposition about it and makes contributions positively through her activism to ensure that systems are put in place. It is almost as if she has dedicated her life's work to ensuring that other people don't go through what she has gone through. She's the most informed person because of her background, the information that she has gathered, the papers that she has presented, her writings. From the preparation of that first meeting up to where we are today, Vanessa has been instrumental. If I was the runner, I had a lot of people seconding me along the way. There were times that it was very black and I, and I remember making a few phone calls to Rob, to Carolyn and, and Alan. I sometimes just say, I, I don't know if I can do this anymore. It's just, it's just, it, it's such a fight. And I needed that because I, I would have collapsed otherwise. If there's one person who deserves the most credit for my journey, it's, it's, it's my husband Stuart. Because without consultation, I simply made an about turn in my life and decided this is what I was gonna do with it from following a career path, bringing money into the household, 
I stopped and I became the founder of an NGO. Without his support, without his commitment to the journey that, that I undertook, um, it, it would never have happened. There's lots of mountains to climb in our journey through life. Uh, and I think that, that you know, one, one goes, goes through, through uphills and downhills. And I think she's, you know, she's had a really tough time. I had to do what I had to do. Because you couldn't, you couldn't do that without being so single-minded. But I think that I sacrificed personal relationships. And I was so involved in, my, in what I was doing that I didn't necessarily notice what was happening around me. You're fighting crime and then you go home and you've, you've got to be the mother and, and, and the, um, give the love and support and bring up your, you know, your child and care for your husband and that. So it hasn't been an easy, an easy journey. She was still able to nurture her family, but to be driven by, by, by this tragedy that had happened to her. Um, she's, she's, she's my hero. How I was in Parliament and, and how I was in fighting, and, and it's a fight, you're constantly fighting, it was how I would be with the people around me. And I look back now and I'm glad that I've come to the realisation that you don't have to fight with everybody all of the time. There's a place for it and it's okay to sometimes let it go. She's always happy, well most of the time. <laughs> if we're together, it's normally just being together, it's not a lot about work. I'm glad that it came to my realisation before it was too late, that actually at the end of the day, the reason I did this was because the values that my father taught me were all about family. That's actually all that matters at the end of the day, is who you love and who loves you. Our childhood memories belong in Mombasa, Kenya. That's where we used to frequent uh, my grandmother's place in Diani. And certainly was the best times of my life. I have amazing memories of uh, visiting there in our holidays, of um, driving, we used to drive from Nairobi to Mombasa. The first palm tree, and then as you approached the sea, it was the first glimpse of the sea. And we said, okay, we must take a little bit of the ashes that we've still got for him to go back to Kenya because he had such a love for Kenya. It was all cloudy and it was Gareth and Vanessa and myself and we were holding the ashes and we just walked and walked and walked because Johnny loved walking along that beach. He would walk for, for hours actually. And suddenly there was a break in the cloud and this ray of sunlight came down and we said, this is the moment. So we all went into the sea, and um, Gareth and Vanessa, they you know, threw, me, threw Daddy up there, and then they, as they were going down in the water, they said, Daddy's on us, Daddy's on us. And you know, you must be able to cry and have these moments that you can also laugh. And my father was a very fatalistic and very pragmatic person. And he, it was always, when I die, I die. In fact, he always used to say to me, there's one sure thing in your life, we're all gonna die. Um, put me in a, a wooden coffin and move on with your life. I mean, he, he, that was how he was. I got married at 19 and um, never, 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 I could never love again. He was my everything. But I have. <laughs> and the kids said I was like a teenager to begin with. <laughs> but they were so happy for me. You've gone through all that pain. And, and, it, and it is, when they say heartache, it actually is. It's real heartache there. And to feel that, 
beautiful feeling again. And I knew that I had Johnny's blessing. And Eric has been amazing. He just accepts the whole family, plus Johnny, who comes with it. And I, I actually couldn't be happier. So now, I'm not going to use all of these, am I? A little mandarin. Yeah. It's delicious in there. That's it. No, that's fine. You don't want too much, or do you want more? <laughs> She doesn't want the mandarin. <laughs> no, don't worry. I want the sweet. Mandarin. How many more? It's all going to be mixed up, so it's actually perfect. <laughs> no, I, I knew mandarin. what you were I know. getting at. The, the mandarin is in the The mandarin's in. <laughs> okay. What was your big leap of faith? Oh, there were so many leaps of faith. I think the leaps of faith came when I hit rock bottom. It's easy when things are going well. People think that's when you leap. No. <laughs> the leap of faith, but it, it comes when, when you feel like you're at the end. And I had to go back to my belief, and this can be done. You must keep fighting. My father was a gutsy man. There was nothing that he felt he couldn't do. He believed in us and he believed in himself. And that is something that we've all carried through to a very large extent in our lives. And, and I also have, have learned to be patient. You know, the wheels turn, but they turn slowly. But at least we are moving in the right direction. And when I look back and I see where we started to where we are now, it's amazing.